Well, good morning, Grace Community Church. How are we this morning? Good. Are we enjoying these beautiful summer sunny days? Oh, yes. Finally, about time, isn't it? Well, one of the things I love most about Grace is how incredibly helpful people are. In fact, last night, just before the sermon that we had in the chapel where I was speaking, one of the gals came up to me and said, um, I'd be happy to help you with the dress code. And I said, the dress code? She said, yes, for all of our speakers, you need to be bald. And I said, okay. And she said, I'd be happy to you know, give you a shave right here, right now. And I said, fine, let's do it here and now. But we could not find a razor. So I hope you won't find it distracting that I'm actually wearing hair this morning. Are, are you guys, are you okay with that? You're okay? Okay, thanks. I, I feel better already knowing about that piece. Um, I want to start with a provocative question this morning. Do you guys like provocative questions? Okay. Here is this one. How many of us are just fed up with all of the good news that we're hearing on television these days? I mean, just too much good news, too many wonderful stories coming on in CNN or Fox or MSNBC. I'm not seeing a lot of hands going up right here. I'm not sure what's with that. But my guess would be that we shouldn't be surprised because editors and news writers know what we want to read, or at least what they say, and they write about the five C's. Do you know what the five C's are? Any editors or writers here? Here they are. New sells when it includes catastrophes, celebrities, I guess no surprise, conflict, controversy, and criticism. I mean, where's the good news in that, right? No wonder it feels like we can turn on the news and it feels depressing. It feels anxious, provoking. It just feels fearful. In fact, even as followers of Jesus Christ, sometimes we can feel like, oh, has God lost control in the world? Is there any good news out there? Maybe we should just all escape to the mountains and dig a hole someplace and wait till God comes again and sorts the whole thing out. You ever felt that way? I know I have sometimes. When you read the news or look at it, it just feels like it's pretty overwhelming. Well, it is my hope this morning that you will hear some really good news. News that is behind the headlines. And in fact, news that may even be far more important than the news that is in the headlines. I wanna share with us this morning from uh, Acts chapter eight and the Philip of story, but springboard from there to tell us stories of things that have so encouraged my heart over the years as I've traveled with World Vision, meeting with church leaders and seeing churches in many countries. And if it's encouraged my heart, I hope that it'll encourage yours as well. And it'll encourage us, not only in our hearts, but that we would recommit to being faithful to in good times and in bad times, even as Philip did in the passage that we will read. Well, living in fearful times is not unique to us. We can imagine that Philip and the Christians in this passage would have felt very fearful because in the passage just prior, Stephen had been killed. And now we enter into a period, it says a period of persecution, in fact, great persecution. So if you have your Bibles or if your electronic devices with you, take a look at Acts chapter 8 with me here. And we'll read starting in the first verse. And Paul approved of Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great laments over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Wow! Do you see this picture? I mean, Stephen was dead, and everybody else was running for their life. Persecution, scattering, seizures in homes, and prison. Which brings us to our first point this morning. That in life, we will have troubles. And many Christ followers since the very beginning have faced severe persecution. The reality is that ever since the first Christians with Christians 
at this time and across the Roman Empire, there has been a persecution because Satan and powers that were in place did not want Jesus to be lifted up. They didn't want to see people liberated by the good news of Jesus, or they felt threatened by the fact that somebody would worship somebody other than the emperor who was in charge right there. They didn't like persecution, and neither do we, and we should do whatever we can to help our brothers and sisters in times of persecution. But here's the point. They were not surprised because each of these groups knew Christ's words very well. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You will be hated by all because of my name but the one who endures to the end will be saved. 11 of the 12 apostles died for their faith. And across the pages of history, Christians in every century and in many countries have died for their faith. In fact, the reality that we have here this morning of coming into a church where we can sing with our voices lifted up and honor and worship and hear about the good news from scripture, that's actually fairly rare as we look across history. Which brings us to our second point. Opposition and persecution can open doors to growing, to sharing our faith. Because let's look at how Philip responded in this context right here. Now, those who went about, were they living in fear? Were they running? No. They went about preaching. Hmm. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ to them. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that were before him. See, Christians had never been there before, but because of the hard times and because they were looking to meet needs, the good news of Jesus Christ was heard in places that it never had been. I had the privilege of being in Hanoi, Vietnam fairly recently and having a fascinating evening with Pastor Tom, parenthesis, name change on Pastor Tom, and with one of his elders. Pastor Tom is the pastor of the Hanoi Evangelical Church there. After a lengthy conversation talking about his ministry, I, I asked Pastor Tom, Pastor, are, are you persecuted for your faith? And both he and the elder, they sat back and they chuckled. I thought, was that a stupid question? And he said, uh, we get beat up all the time. In fact, uh, whenever the church seems to be growing too much, we get hauled into the officials' offices and told to stop seeing our church growing like this. But he said, it's okay. Um, and even though we know that that might be another night when the thugs are going to beat us up on our way just coincidentally home from the official's office, it's okay. It doesn't bother us because the Lord is doing remarkable things here in Vietnam. The church is growing, and even in public schools, in public schools in certain areas where there's a high concentration of Christians, kids are there who are learning Bible stories and they are singing Christian songs in these schools right under the watchful eye of Uncle Ho. Do we know who Uncle Ho is? Ho Chi Minh, the founder of the communist country there in Vietnam, as many of us know. They said that the church is growing rapidly and out of Vietnam's 90 million people, now 12% are Christians. The Catholic Church and the Evangelical Church are growing very rapidly. But he went on to say that they recently got a call from the director of prisons there in Vietnam saying, would you come in, can, can we talk? So Pastor Tom said, well, of course we can. And there, rather than being threatened, they said, we're having a real problem here in Vietnam these days because even though the gross national product is going up and people have more money than they've ever had before, they're spending a lot of that money on bad things, on things that often lead to crime, whether it's drugs or prostitution or alcohol or pornography or, or other things. We're seeing the fabric of society melting, and there are more people in prisons here in Hanoi than we've ever seen before. And as we're looking at rehab programs, none of them are working. 
except when people come in and people talk about this Jesus thing. We don't get it, but it seems like lives are transformed. So would you please come in to the prisons here and, and, and do this Jesus talk thing because we know that lives will be changed. So Pastor Tom said, yes, we can do that. And then the elder said, well, you know, it's not only that, but in the director of public services that we have, in social services, we are told often that people feel that uh, kids, young people, who have always been respectful to their parents here in Vietnam, are increasingly living without a moral compass. And they're not respecting their parents, which has been our tradition forever here. And so we see that marriages are falling apart and families are falling apart. But as the director of social services, we see that you Christians have the best marriages that, that we know and that you have families that are really intact and respectful. So would you as pastors and, and leaders doing this Christian thing come in and, and help train our social services and how they can apply these principles from your holy book uh, across these parts of the country? Could you do that for us? And they said, yeah. We're, we can help you with that. I, I was so blown away by the story that I then verified it with our staff there. I said, is this really the case happening? And they said, oh yes, we hear about this very often, that there are opportunities that are open even while people are being persecuted in their contexts right there. But back to Philip. It wasn't only that he and his friends were surviving a persecution they were looking to meet the needs of those who were persecuting them. This is a remarkable reality. I'm not sure by any means that that would be the case in my life. Look at verse 7 and 8. For unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice and came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And so there was much joy in the city. Yeah, I bet there was. If people were sick and now healed, if they were lame, if they were deaf and dumb or blind and now able to see and talk, you know that there would be joy in the city. Instead of hiding, these Christians looked to meet the physical and spiritual needs even of those who were giving them a very hard time which is an important principle here, that if our eyes and our hearts and our minds are open, God will put in front of us those with needs with whom questions can be provoked, to which Jesus is the answer, and bring much joy to them and to us as well. This has been the case of ministries like World Vision in a hundred countries around the world, but it's just as true in Auburn and in the South Sound as it is in Syria. Questions that Philip might have had, or we might. Philip, why are you helping people? Why are you healing them? Why are you meeting their needs when you were being persecuted? Or to us here, why do you help needy people? Why do you serve at the food bank? Uh, why do you reach out to people that look very different than you do? That come from different backgrounds, uh, people that have uh, different cultural um, uh, backgrounds and speak different languages and eat different foods. Why do you do that? Why do you volunteer at Young Life during the course of the week? Why do you pray publicly at meals? Why do you tithe? I mean, why do you give 10% of all that you make to ministries to, to further the good news of the gospel and to meet people's needs around the world? Why do you do that? These are all questions that are provoked to which ultimately Jesus can be the answer as we say, well, let me tell you why it is. It's because my life has been changed. And as my life has been changed, I love you. And I love your people. And I love the people with your skin color and your background and your nationality because Jesus does and because I have had my heart transformed. That's why I do all of these things. The remarkable reality is that God has often prepared people's hearts to listen to the good news. And wherever we are, whether in Syria, whether in Auburn or the South Sound, 
God was there before we were, and he has a plan for us while we are there. God has already prepared people's hearts to listen to the good news. We see this now turning to verse 28 in this chapter. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose, and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, who oversaw all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in her chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you were reading? And he said, how can I? unless somebody guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. The heart was open and somebody was ready to respond. There are countries in the world today where the penalty of becoming a Christian is death. And in a country whose name I cannot give us this morning, four years ago, the spiritual leader in the entire western part of the country spoke to World Vision's national director, and he said this, we have seen your help in building roads and building schools, in training midwives and in feeding the hungry and providing water. We have been praying for somebody to help us with our families, and we believe that you are the answer to our prayers. And so, three years ago, we started a Bible-based program by an overt Christian ministry, and it trains Muslim imams, and since then, 100,000 people by the end of last year, in biblical principles about fatherhood, and husbanding, and motherhood, and families, and forgiveness, and how to bless our children. Because in that context, as in so many of our contexts, children don't get blessed. They're they're not told by their parents, we love you, we see a good future for you, we believe in you, we know that you will do well, God loves you. Those things don't happen, and yet they're so important for kids. And so they're being trained in overtly biblical principles in this country from which you have not heard good news, I promise you, in a very long time. God is preparing hearts from Abu Dhabi to Afghanistan to Angola to Auburn. And it is true in our schools, as we are teachers or students, in our businesses, in our cubes or workplaces or factories or neighborhoods. The question is, do you and I, like Philip, have the vision and the love to believe God and reach beyond ourselves into the hearts of those that have a need and that God has prepared. I know that many of you do, but it is our prayer that that vision would increase and continue. It was this kind of vision and love that I saw last year when I was in Cambodia. The film The Killing Fields was made about the worst of times in Cambodia. In 1977, the communist dictator Pol Pot rolled in with his army, and within three years, killed one-third of the population of Cambodia, between two and three million people, starting with everybody who was educated, hence the doctors and the teachers, the lawyers, the accountants, and even the aid workers who were there to help the poor. This is no distant or forgotten memory to World Vision's staff there. Because in 1977, there were 270 staff that World Vision had in Cambodia. And over the next three years, 267 of the 270 were killed. Only three survived. That's 99% that were killed in those three years. Remarkably, many of their sons and daughters and nieces and nephews are working for World Vision now again. 
In the early 1990s, it was estimated that there were less than 1,000 Christians in the entire country of Cambodia. A few survived in refugee camps, but Christians returned, and Christians started to meet the needs, even of people who had oppressed them and killed members of their family. And the church started to grow. I met with the national church leaders in Phnom Penh last year. These men and women are my heroes. That term is easily banded about. These people are heroes. They told me, Tori, the killing fields are becoming the harvest fields. Because now there's not a thousand Christians, there are 50,000 Christians. And the church is growing very quickly. We visited with a number of these churches and these pastors around the country. One of them was Van Ta. Her home, a tiny shack in the urban area of Phnom Penh. It was no more than 20 feet at most from side to side, about half the size of my garage. Van was abandoned by her husband seven years ago, and she became a follower of Jesus Christ about four years ago. And then in her church, she took a class on biblical principles about marriage and family and caring for her community. And so in her little one-room shack, Van started a, a little Bible study to talk about these things. And very soon there were 20 people there. You might call it a church because they were studying biblical principles and they were praying together even amidst the squalor and the difficulty of their lives. But Van said that her vision went beyond that because nobody in her initial village where she had grown up 75 miles north had ever known Jesus Christ. It was a 100% Buddhist village, and she loved those people very much. So Van hopped on her little motorcycle every other weekend and drove on her own dime all the way up and back in order to meet with folks and to share with them these wonderful biblical principles about how God loves us and how fathers and mothers and husbands and wives and sons and daughters and families can work together and how they can serve the community. And today there are 100 people, who, many of whom have found faith in Jesus Christ in that beautiful little community, thanks to a woman who had nothing but who said it's not gonna stop me because I love these people and I'm going beyond myself to meet the needs of these folks who I love very much. One of Van's very favorite verses comes from the last verse in the Old Testament. It looks forward to the time when Jesus comes again. And it said, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And Van said, and I get to be a part of making this happen. The reality is that the world over, families are falling apart. And marriages are in great disrepair. But we, as followers of Jesus Christ, filled with his spirit, have an incredible opportunity to step into the lives of people and share by our examples, by our love, by our witness, by conversations, that there are more than just broken marriages. And more questions can be provoked, such as why do you seem to have the love in your marriage? Why do you seem to have love for your kids, even though they do this or that? How do you do that? Why do you do that? We can participate in the witness that will occur before Christ returns. Wouldn't it be something if we can participate in these promises and watch these f prophecies being fulfilled even in our own time? Well, we can. And that is a theme that we pick up often in Scripture. Jesus says, the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel will be preached to the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come, but not before people from every tribe and nation and background and skin color and ethnicity have heard and had an opportunity to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 7, in one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, 
there is this great image where in front of the Lord, people from every tribe are singing and they're lifting their hands and saying to you, Lord, is due glory and honor and power and thanks and might because of all that you have done. And when I walk around South Center these days and I see people that look so different from one another and from us, I think, I wonder how many of these people will be with us in heaven because they have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. We can either look at people who are very different from us and say they are those people, or we can say these are the beautiful faces of people who we have an opportunity to invite to be with us forever and ever in heaven because they too are part of Christ's family. That's the opportunity that we have if we have the eyes, if we have the vision to reach beyond ourselves into our cubes and factories and into our schools and into our hospitals and places in order to see people as Jesus does and to invite them to be a part of the great things that Christ is doing in their hearts. Another verse is that from Joel where it says, in the end times, Old men will dream dreams and young men will have visions. And this too we see happening increasingly these days. One of my former staff, when I was national director in Mali for those nine years, said, Tori, I went to bed a Muslim, but I woke up a Christian. It happened like this. She had been looking for, for resolution to many things in her life. Now she lay there asleep, she had a vision. It was of Jesus who stood at the end of her bed in a long white robe and said, Anna, I am the way and the truth and the life. You will find all these things in me. Come to me. And she did. And she woke up and in the years that followed, Anna led much of her family to faith in Jesus Christ. And this story is heard again and again and again across the Muslim and Hindu and Buddhist world. The Lord is pouring out his spirit and we get to be a part of cheering this on and of seeing it and knowing these stories and praying for those who are on the front lines and praying that God would do these things right here. The reality is around the world that there are awful things that are happening from tsunamis to earthquakes to droughts to man-made disasters, wars and civil wars. All of these things are horrible and we do our best to mitigate the results of them. But it is often these things as in our own lives that God uses to open up the hearts of people groups that have never looked to Jesus Christ before. In the Syrian conflict that is encompassing four countries, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan, there are now 12 million refugees or internally displaced people. How many is 12 million? It is more than the entire population of the states of Washington and Oregon. There are that many people this morning and these people are the least loved people in the world. Nobody wants them. Nobody wants to invite them into their country. Nobody even wants to provide them food or water so that they would stay there. They have no nationality, no education. They have lost their passports. They don't want to come to the States necessarily or to Europe. They want to go home, but they can't go home because their lives will be threatened and killed like many of the people in their own families who have already died. And yet, Christian ministries are reaching into these places already. And we have the opportunity to support these ministries that are working there, like World Vision and many others. In the Syrian war, these things are happening. But in Lebanon, Pastor George is the pastor of a small conservative Baptist church. To be honest, he and everyone else in his church hated those Syrians because they had invaded Lebanon and they were there under the jackboot of the Syrian invaders for 29 years, right up to the year 2005. They hated the Syrian refugees who were there 
And they often said, it's too bad to be you, refugees. But gradually, God's Spirit began to change the heart of Pastor George and his church. He changed their heart to reach out to them. And little by little, they decided, well, we need to do something. And so they offered food and, and then access to water and health and education and child protection and legal rights. Pastor George provided these things and his little church of 25 people started to grow. It has now grown to between two and 300 people, most of whom were Muslims just three or four years ago or who are Muslims today but are still continuing to come to Pastor George's church. And when asked, why do you attend Pastor George's church? One former Muslim woman said amongst her tears, because no one has ever loved us the way Pastor George has. No one has ever cared for us the way these Christians have. We've never known Christians before, but everything that we've ever heard about the Christians is wrong. We see that they love us. We see that they care about us. They know our names. They invite us into our homes. And so we want to know their Jesus, who they have said is the reason that they do what they do. These are stories from around the world. But how does it apply to us right here in Auburn? We have the opportunity to reach out to the world but in another way, the world has already come to Seattle in the South Sound. There are over a hundred nationalities represented right here in the South Sound and that many languages being spoken over the dinner tables at night. From those of us that come from Green River College and other colleges to other places in the world, I see this as such a beautiful move of God's Spirit to have people from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, joining those of us that have lived in this context for a long time who are coming to faith and coming to know the love of Jesus Christ all is one giant beautiful body that will one day be able to look Jesus in the face and say thank you for hope and love and all that you have given us Jesus we are yours because you have given yourself to us we can reach out we can be a part of that, whether supporting what goes on there or reaching out to those that are right next to us right here. For many people that are here from other countries, they are looking for the very same thing that the Ethiopian eunuch was looking for, someone to explain to them that they can have a relationship with God and that it comes through Jesus Christ. Like Philip, we can share the good news about Jesus to those God brings to us. Verse 35 says this, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told the good news about Jesus. Philip was a faithful witness to a visitor from another nation, another language, and another religion who was there in his own country. And look what happened. God had prepared the Ethiopian's heart. He was ready he made a decision, and that very day he was baptized. I had the privilege of being in Ethiopia in January. The Ethiopian church, which is now 60 million people, out of the 100 million people in Ethiopia, says that their roots go back to when? To this very story that we are reading about here this morning, to the Ethiopian eunuch, who then went back to the court of Candace, the queen. And today, the Ethiopian church is oftentimes doing the very thing that Philip did, reaching out beyond their borders to serve people of their own faith, of other faiths, and of no faith, just like we see here, to meet the common community needs that are there. What do we have as needs, whether we are Coptic Orthodox or Ethiopian uh, Muslim. Well, we all care about our children. Well, great, what can we do to serve our children? Well, we have a huge need for water. 
well, let's work together to provide water, as we see right here. And so in January, we were able to start a water program that today is serving 15,000 people that did not have fresh water six months ago. They are drinking every night from fresh water where we saw people just prior that were drinking out of horrible, muddy streams. They have fresh water. But the better news even than that is that they are learning about the living water, the living water of Jesus Christ because the Ethiopian church is reaching beyond its borders to Muslims, to, to other people of other faiths, and they have taken the risk to break the barriers and to serve even at great cost to themselves. The church is growing. And as we see here, young people are everywhere and are often leading the church because people know that the church is relevant. It is meeting the needs of the community and it is offering hope for this life and in the life to come. Across the world, the church is growing. That is the good news behind the headlines. You will not hear about it in the news, and oftentimes it is best that you don't hear it in the news because that would put at great risk some of our Christians, friends, in a lot of these places. In all these cases, the church is growing because Christians reached beyond themselves into the lives of those that looked and spoke very different from themselves. We're doing that here at Grace Community Church. We're doing that with students. We are doing that also with the wonderful ministries that we're having with women right here. As we see in examples, not only of international students, but reaching out in this place right here to up to 400 men and women and young families who are those in great need. I'm so proud of Grace. And I see that whether it is through ministries like the food bank or helping in our schools or clinics or hospitals, we as the family of grace are reaching out and are making a difference. But perhaps God would move us even more into places and into relationships that we've not yet had a vision for. Sometimes we might feel, oh, I wish things were the way that they used to be. Sometimes we might feel like, oh, I, I have a f f um, I'm afraid. But perfect love casts out fear. And we are motivated by love because Christ loved us. The takeaway that we have this morning is that we have been given the incredible joyous privilege and the choice to be faithful witnesses to those very different from ourselves whom God has prepared amidst their times and ours. As in Philip's time, the world has become a great place of need, but also of opportunity. And in this series on faithfulness, let us be faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ, whether it's to the end of the world or to the end of the cul-de-sac. And if we do, there will be much joy in the city in their lives, and in ours. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have given us the incredible opportunity of being ambassadors of Jesus Christ in this world. Lord, we, we think of that vision of all of us in heaven, from every tribe and nation, all loved by you, who are there because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, make us people, not only who are passionate to see people who are like us there, but people from around the world, people from around the world who are now with us in the South Sound. Lord, give us a love, give us a courage, give us a passion, give us a commitment that we might be your courageous witnesses, even here, that Jesus Christ might be lifted up, that people would be blessed, and that we would have much joy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.